Bad. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Oh, much better, much better. Um, nice to see you all. Nice to be with you this morning. Uh, first things first, if you were willing and able this morning, could you please stand for just a moment? Everybody stand. If you are able and comfortable to do so. And look back kind of in this general vicinity next to this big clock that says 1139 and kind of wave at the camera there to our good brother Shane Scott. I'm assuming he's there. Very well, there could just be some random people in Texas that are like, why are they waving at us? But I assume that he's there. All right, you can be seated now. Shane, if you're listening, just know that we're all praying for you. We hope that you'll be back with us. Uh, You're on our hearts at this time. I want to give a big thank you to Micah this morning. Um, Micah is doing a wonderful job. You know, it wasn't that long ago that I was in Micah's position, uh, and I was, you know, very nervous about coming up here, and I told his mom last week that this is just the dream family to work with as as a young preacher, Uh, and I've already started to see the fruits of, of his work with Shane and with Phil, and as well as the encouragement that comes from this family. Uh, I can remember, uh, you know, when I started at FC, I got to sit at the feet of his father, who taught me biology endlessly, uh, which I went on to get a degree in, uh, and then on Sundays being here and sitting at the feet of his older brother, Daniel, who presented to us some of the finest lessons uh, that we heard from the pulpit, and then now to sit at his feet as he grows is truly a blessing. So such a wonderful family, the Chandler family. We're so thankful for Micah's work uh, and his desire to preach with us this summer. One other announcement that I wanted to make, uh, you may have noticed, you may not have noticed, but there happens to be a black Jeep out there in the parking lot this morning. Don't know whose that is, uh, but it's pretty nice. No, I'm just kidding. It is mine. Uh, If you don't know, uh, Yes, I got the Jeep back. It's in rough shape. Um, It's not really drivable, but, you know, it made it here this morning. We're going to get rid of it. But uh, thank you all so much for the prayers, the financial help that you've given to Emily and I. Uh, You know, at the end of the day, it is just stuff. A car is just a thing. Uh, But really, the more emotional aspect of it has been uh, the wonderful just encouragement and support and kind words and wishes from, from this group here. And so I'm truly, truly thankful for all that you have done for me, and we're thankful that, that we got it back, and now we'll get some money out of it too. Uh, so that is also uh, a wonderful blessing. Uh, so you might be expecting to hear a sermon on, you know, don't steal people's cars, leave another man's property alone, something along those lines, but that's not quite what we're going to talk about today. Uh, if you want to open your Bibles to where Colin read for us this morning, that's going to be Psalm 51. That's where we're going to start in this morning, Psalm 51. It may surprise you, but, and it may be a little bizarre to think, but actually Psalm 51 is one of my favorite psalms in the Bible, and it's kind of for an odd reason. When we think about people who commit sin and we think about people who kind of have this burden, this weight of the transgressions on them, we don't always get a good look into what's going on in their heart. And what I love about Psalm 51 is we see David's heart, this man who's called a man after God's own heart, chosen by God to be king of his people, made central to God's promises to bring about the Messiah. You see this wonderful king who has fallen because of his sin. And if you don't know the background of this psalm, what happens in 2 Samuel chapter 11 and 12 Uh, kind of just ruins the kind of uptrend that God's kingdom is on because David sins. And we're not going to turn there this morning, but if you would just look over and actually the sort of summary for this psalm is in the title that I think serves as a good context to the words that Colin read for us this morning. That gives us an idea of what this psalm is about. It says, To the choir master, in Psalm 51, this is the title probably in all caps in your Bible, it says, A psalm of David when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. Kind of an odd name for a psalm. I think we can all agree, those of us who understand, you know, what's going on behind the scenes there. But the bottom line is that David's sin kind of ruined things for himself, ruined things for his family, resulted in the death of countless people, even sent the kingdom uh, of God's people down this spiral into suffering and just terrible awfulness for several hundred years up until Jesus comes. Uh, That basically came about from this event in some way. So, One could imagine that when you read the words of this psalm, there's a lot of emotional 
kind of gravity to this. And so I want to kind of emphasize some of the statements that are found here in Psalm 51. In verse 2, King David says, Wash me thoroughly, O God, cleanse me. Kind of giving us an indication to the intimacy of his relationship with God. He's pouring himself out to God because of the guilt of his sin. He says, Against you only I have sinned in verse 4. Is that technically true? Well, sort of. Uh, In some ways, he did sin against God only. In some ways, he did sin against other people. I mean, he certainly sinned against Bathsheba, against um, the soldier that he had killed. Uh, He sinned against his people by lying to them, deceiving them, and then, of course, to God. I think what we can see from this is that ultimately, he's putting his relationship with God as the one thing that can be saved and the one thing that it he needs to save in order to kind of relieve himself of the guilt that he's feeling. So he's saying against you only to kind of emphasize that God is at the core of his heart here in this moment. He continues on in verse 6 to recount that God is the one who gives him wisdom and secret heart, kind of indicating to us the special type of relationship they have together. And then in verse 10, he says, renew my spirit, O God, cast me not away in verse 11. These words demonstrate not only to us the severity of his actions, but also his understanding of God's merciful and compassionate character, his long-suffering nature, his grace that he extends to the faithful of his people. His guilt that David carries in this moment had brought him to the only person who could heal him, could relieve the guilt that weighed upon him which ironically is the person who has the capacity to ultimately condemn him. And we find that he begs God for renewal of his spirit. And thankfully for us this morning, David finds that renewal. He truly does. Of course, there are consequences for his actions, which I just reflected on a moment ago. But ultimately, he remains king. He remains central to God's promises. His bloodline is still going to be heir to the throne. Things are going to work out okay in a way for him, and he does find forgiveness for the sins he has committed. But one would imagine, to some extent, he's probably going to feel some level of guilt for his entire life. For his entire life, David will be forced to remember this low point. If you're like me, you may have a conscience that quickly consumes you and brings on the rebukes to you before a Nathan can even get the message in, right, that you've done wrong. That's kind of how I am. I'm normally beating myself up the moment. As soon as something happens, I'm kind of walking away, already feeling the shame that my conscience brings on for what I've done. And a couple of weeks ago, I was reflecting on this this summer. In Bible class where I teach at Foundation Christian Academy, Uh, I was talking to my 8th graders. Remember, these kids are 13 and 14, and you're about to have your minds blown throughout this sermon, but just keep this in mind as a background. These kids are 13 and 14. We began talking in our class about guilt and about the remorse that we have for the things that we have done, for the transgressions we have committed against others and ultimately against God. And I recalled to my students my senior year of high school my weightlifting final exam. So I was 18, it was the end of my senior year, getting ready for graduation. It's May, you know, senior ice has kicked in, I'm never showing up. We had the weightlifting final. Finals broken up into two parts. First half of the final, all you had to do was show up, do a bench press max, whatever you got, that was the max you got 100%. As long as you showed up to do it, you were good. Yeah. And then the other half was to run a mile. Uh, pff, pretty easy. Actually, believe it or not, I was in pretty good shape back then. I've fallen a few, you know, notches down uh, from that at this moment. But back then, I was like, whatever. Well, I happened to not be at school the day of the final, so I had to make it up by myself. And so I came back to school. I'm making it up. My coach just sent me out. I did my bench press. I got the 50, you know, whatever. And he was like, go outside, um, run your mile, and come back. I was like, all right, I'll go out there. And so I get to the track, and about two laps in, I'm like, Phew. This ain't it. I'm, I'm, I'm done. And so I just took a look at the football field that was, you know, in the middle of the track. I was like, ah, I'm just going to cut across that. And I just started strolling across, you know, caught my breath. I was, whew, this is pretty good. <laughs> and, then, and then came around the next lap, cut that one too. And I got about halfway across the field on the fourth lap, about to be done. Uh, and I look at my weightlifting coach is just standing there like this. <laughs> 
And I'm like, ooh. Um, and so he's like, seriously? And he just like walks away. And at first I just rolled my eyes in frustration that I had been caught. You know, I'm not getting away with this. I was like, well, I guess I got to run two more laps. So I ran two real laps. Uh, and then I came back inside. And he just looked at me and he's like, I'm putting the grade in. Uh, and I was like, really? I was like, I cheated. And he was like, I know. And he looked at me and he was like, you're our captain. You were a senior for this team and you just let me down. And by extension, you just let your teammates down. I was like, could I have just failed the final instead of hearing that? You know, um, I could feel my face was like burning. And so I walked away. Uh, and I left, and I got 100 on the final. Um, and here I am, you know, now 23, uh, married, uh, teaching, and, you know, trying to teach these kids academic honesty, and one cannot help but kind of look at the irony of the situation. Uh, and from time to time, especially when I'm trying to fall asleep at night, uh, that memory gets, like, implanted, which is like a light bulb just turns on, and I relive it over and over and over again. And I don't want to say that I'm haunted by it, but I feel the guilt of that mistake. Does that make sense, everybody with me? I, I feel the guilt of that. And when I relayed this to my students, they were like, come on, dude, you were 18. Like, you know, that was forever ago. Like, give your, cut yourself some slack, you know, move on. And it kind of has been on my mind as summer has started, and I've been wrestling with this idea of guilt and so I look at the example of David, and I see a man who committed the sin, but was called, you know, a man after God's own heart. And I see the guilt that is probably plaguing him, looming over him. And I recognize that I am somebody who feels guilt from time to time. And I just wonder to myself, how is it that David could say, renew my spirit? How is it that he could walk away from this and trust that God is going to forgive him and that he has been forgiven truly for the mistakes that he's made? I think this is something that all of us as Christians, whether we're new Christians or whether we're seasoned Christians, Christians at the end of our life, it's something we all have to wrestle with, and that is, what is our relationship to our past sins? How should we think about these things? Should we be like David and just pray about it and then hopefully move on and hope for the best? Or should we allow ourselves to be haunted by our past? Is that to be our relationship with our sin? Uh, that's a difficult question to answer. And I hope that by our study together this morning, uh, we can walk away with the same hope and assurance that David had uh, that our guilt has been washed away and that our sins are washed away and that we can have assurance that our guilt points to something that is actually good and it is not something that should haunt us at all. And so in order to answer this question of our relationship to guilt, what is it? How do we deal with guilt? What are we to make of this? I'd like to look at three characters in scripture this morning that carried immense guilt and see how they dealt with guilt. And once we've looked at these three people, I hope that we can come away with the same assurance that David did. So number one, let's look at Judas' guilt of betrayal. Our first person I'd like to examine is perhaps the most infamous person in the New Testament, maybe even in the entire Bible some may present. Many people are fascinated with Judas as a character, myself included, and my students as well, because we get so caught up in all these like questions about his motivations and why he does what he does to Jesus. And I'm sure that most everybody in here knows by now the story of Judas and how he's in this inner circle of disciples that are following Jesus around. He's the treasurer, and then ultimately he betrays Jesus and sells him out, and that leads to his arrest and then trial uh, and crucifixion. But I don't want to get too caught up in kind of the free will side of things and whether or not Judas had the option to do this and what his motivations were. I just like to take a look uh, at what the text actually tells us. And so this is what we know from Scripture. First, that John chapter 12, verses 4 through 6, if you want to turn there. Also, my Bible was in my Jeep when it was stolen. Uh, ironically enough, it was the one thing that was still in my car when I got it back. However, it does reek like drugs. Uh, so I got a new Bible this week, uh, and we're going to be turning to a lot of passages, not only because 
The Bible says things way better than I can say them, but because it'll be good practice for us to kind of loosen up the pages of my new Bible. So hopefully you'll play along with me this morning. So John chapter 12, we get a little bit of a background as to how the disciples are spending their money and specifically who's kind of in charge of that. So verses 4 through 6 of John chapter 12 say that Judas, one of his disciples that was about to betray him, so John's pointing, you know, toward this event, um, he says, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief, and having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was inside of it. So not only is he kind of the disciple that's in charge of handling the money, but we also know he's not a very good one at that because he's dipping his hands into it and taking some for himself, right? So we already know this about Judas, but in addition to this, he's the one, as John indicates here in this passage, and then also in Matthew chapter 26, we have indicated to us that he's going to be the one to deliver over Jesus uh, to be betrayed and arrested uh, and eventually executed. And so let's look over at this as well. It says, then one of the twelve, whose name was Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, what will you give me if I deliver him over to you? And they paid him 30 pieces of silver. And from that moment, he sought his opportunity to betray him. Interesting information about Jesus, a uh, good little background about him. And then another kind of curious detail that's presented to us in John's account of all of this is in John chapter 13 and verse 2, we're told that Satan actually plants this into Judas's heart. Uh, so in other words, that temptation arises in Judas uh, to do this, to sell Jesus out, to sell one of his friends out. And the price that he eventually is going to sell Jesus out for is going to be 30 pieces of silver, which if you recall in the Old Testament in Exodus chapter 21, which I'm sure everyone is super familiar with, uh, that's actually the price of a slave is 30 pieces of silver. And so for merely this amount of money of a slave, that's how much Jesus is going to be sold for by somebody who's supposed to be one of his closest friends and most reliable disciples. You can already see that when things come to fruition here, there's going to be that, that guilt that's laying upon him. I want to draw our attention to Matthew chapter 27, where we see the aftermath of G Judas's betrayal of Jesus. We get to kind of see the guilt that really starts to form inside of him. So this is after Jesus has been arrested. He's now been taken to trial. And Judas is seeing that he's actually been condemned to die. He's seeing that he's actually going to die. And this is how he's feeling. So pay attention to Matthew chapter 27, verses 1 through 5. When morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And they bound him and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate the governor. And then Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned. And he changed his mind, and he brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. And he says to them, I've sinned by betraying an innocent man, innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? See to it yourself. So in other words, you go handle this yourself, pal. This is your problem. And throwing down the pieces of silver into the temple, Judas departed, and he went and perhaps one of the most darkest verses in all of Scripture, it says that he hanged himself. He took his own life. You want to talk about guilt. The guilt, the burden that would be on somebody's heart, on their shoulders, to take their own life. I do not want to make this point lightly this morning, but rather with great compassion. Ending your life for something that you have done or for something that is, you know, looming over your heart, this is a tragic end, one that God does not wish for you. And I'm sure as many of you have, uh, I've known people who have done this and have attempted to do it because of the guilt that they have felt. Judas saw that Jesus, his friend, was condemned. And his actions, he recognized, directly resulted in his friend's death. And so the weight was too much for him to bear. 
Now, I'm not God. We're not God. We, we don't have to state whether or not this man could have been saved. That's not a question that we have to try to answer this morning. We don't make that call. But with that said, the Bible does clearly teach that the reasonable, appropriate, and logical response to our guilt is never to take your own life. There may be a lifetime of consequences for things that you have done, but there is forgiveness. There is a release of that guilt. Think about David that we just read in Psalm 51. His life is going to be a mess. His family, his lineage, his kingdom is going to be a mess as a direct result of his sin. But he did find forgiveness. I think if we're being honest, we're not always so forthcoming with what we feel guilty for. It's because we feel guilty. There is shame and there is despair in the guilt that we bear. But what I hope everyone can understand this morning and can see by this bad example in the New Testament is that there is only one person that you can always, always go to. Someone that you can always express the pain and agony and the shame of our guilt. And it is to God. The weight of guilt should drive us to God, like it did for David. There was no other place for him to go when Nathan said, Thou art the man. The only place for him to turn was to God. The weight of our guilt should drive us closer to God, not away from him like it did for Judas. Someone who did something actually very similar to Judas and yet found themselves on a very different course was our second person of guilt we're going to look at this morning, and that is Peter. Peter, as you probably know, also held some guilt for betrayal in a way, although slightly different. He betrayed Jesus as a friend, not by selling him out, but by forsaking him altogether, by denying his association to Jesus as one of his disciples. You may still be in Matthew, so if you want to look over in chapter 26, just a couple chapters over from where we just were, I'd like to look Matthew chapter 26, verse 30 through 35. This is where Jesus foretells Peter's denial. It says, When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And Jesus said to them, You will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. And here's Peter, probably should have kept his mouth shut here. But he says, Though they will all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. And Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this very night, before the rooster crows, you will deny me not once, not twice, but three times. And Peter said to him, Even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same. Peter, I mean, bless him. He probably meant really, really well here, right? I mean, some of us can probably identify with Peter. I find, I'm a Peter. If you know me, I'm a Peter through and through. This thing is just, this thing has no filter, and I just get myself into trouble over and over again, and especially when I'm feeling anxious about something, uh, you just never know what I'm going to say. Actually, I'm experiencing a little bit of that right now. A couple of weeks ago, we were doing some testing at school, this was the day after my Jeep was stolen, or I guess the first work day after my Jeep was stolen. And you know, I'm sulking, I'm walking around campus, and I've got to do progress monitoring, got to do this testing with my class, and I'm a little bit upset about it. And because of Wi-Fi issues, I had to move my class to the gym. Well, my students weren't there yet, and so I spent about 20 minutes setting up tables for my students in the gym, kind of an area for our class to test. Well, in the time that I had set it up and when school started, uh, somebody who wasn't even supposed to be doing progress monitoring got asked to substitute, and so he gladly was like, oh yeah, I'll substitute, and he was told to take the students to the gym. So naturally, he came into the gym 
He's just the substitute. Where does he take the kids? Of course, he takes them to the tables that are set up, right? That makes perfect sense. Well, here I come bringing my class in, and now all the tables are taken, and they're sitting there. You know, my eighth graders are immediately getting ready to go crazy because they're 13, and, you know, if something doesn't go according to plan, they lose their minds. So uh, I just walk over, and I just look at the teacher, and I just said, I, you know, I'm feeling, uh, you know, my intrusive thoughts won here, okay? This isn't a high moment for me, but hopefully you can see, you know, the guilt of why I said this. And I just looked at him and I said, hey, you're welcome for the free labor, buddy. And I walked away. And he was just like, what the? (laughs) And (laughs) that may seem a little comical, but no doubt he was confused. Um, And so I messaged him and I was like, hey, can we talk? And I came to him and I was like, I feel so guilty because of this. And I kind of laid out the situation and explained. And then I was like, please, will you forgive me? And that brother, of course, because we're friends, he definitely, he was super forgiving. He was like, honestly, I didn't think anything of it. Just thought you were having a bad day. And I was like, that meant a lot and showed a lot about his character. But I can identify with Peter. I'm, I'm feeling this. I understand how Peter's heart is in the right place. My heart was in the right place, too, because I woke up that day, and I was like, don't you say anything to anybody. Don't you say anything to anybody. And then I did it. I, I mean, that actually happened. Like, 10 minutes before this happened, I was like, I know you're feeling it, so don't say anything. And then I did it anyway. So, I mean, I was a Peter, right, just like this. Uh, obviously, I wasn't denying my association to God, but in some ways, I was, you know, just like we sang this morning. Each time that we disobey God's commands to each other, we were saying, I'm the one. And it's a constant reminder of why Jesus had to die for us. And so, you know how this story plays out, where Peter does deny Jesus. Uh, Just later on in this chapter, in verses 69 through 75, we see how it plays out, where the rooster does crow, Peter denies him three times, but I'd like to draw our attention to actually the end of this section here in verse 75. It's the last verse of chapter uh, 26. Verse 75, Peter remembers the words of Jesus, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And this is how the section ends. Peter, no doubt, feeling this guilt on his chest, he goes out and he weeps bitterly. I had a student point this out for me uh, in class, a a 13-year-old, brilliant young man, and he points this out for me, and I'm not exactly sure where the best spot is in this lesson to make this point, but he just holds his hand up, and he starts to make these connections between Peter and Judas, and so I'm going to lay it out for you the way that he did for our class. So the first thing that he noticed is that both of these two disciples, we know they're disciples, uh, they're both known to kind of step out of line, right? Judas for his um, misuse of the money, and then Peter for his misuse of his mouth, uh, and then both also have their sins foretold by Jesus, Uh, both, like, Jesus tells both of them, hey, you're going to do this, right? You know, Judas is foretold to betray Jesus. Peter is foretold to deny Jesus. Both of them have this happen to them. And then, when you look at betrayal and you look at denial, these are actually remarkably similar, right? When you think about, if you are denying your friendship with somebody, you are betraying them in a way, right? And if you're betraying somebody, you're definitely denying that they're your friend because you're betraying them. And so very similar sins actually overtake both of these men. And then both of them carry immense guilt and weep bitterly for their sins. And so I'm, I'm listening, and I'm like, wow, this is really good, this is really good, this is really good. I'm like, there's no way it could get any better than this. And then my student, he continues on, and he says this. My jaw's already on the floor at this point. And he says, Mr. Cook, when you think about it, the only thing that separates Peter from Judas is that Peter turns to life in Jesus when he is resurrected, and Judas turns to death. Let that sink in for a moment. Peter returns to life in Jesus at the resurrection, and Judas turns to death. He's absolutely right. All of us are Peter's and Judas's at the same time, right? Our sin is sin. We're all guilty. We're all standing before God, right? And we're all guilty. 
Both of these men were guilty, but the difference is one ran to life in Jesus and one ran to death. And actually, the one that ran to life in Jesus, for the sake of time, we won't turn there, but if you look in John chapter 20 at the resurrection, Peter literally runs to the tomb. He's running to Jesus just at the word that there might be some hope that his Savior is still alive. One could imagine that he probably really wants to make things right. What is the last thing that he basically said to Jesus? I'm not going to deny you. That's like their last conversation, basically, is him saying, I'm, I'm not going to do it, and then he goes and he does it. One could imagine that if Jesus knew he was going to do that, then Jesus probably knew that he did do it, uh, and of course, he wants to make things right with his friend, and if you know how this story turns out for Peter, we can see him actually turning to life in Jesus at the end of John chapter 21. This is the very end of the gospel story, John chapter 21, where the two of them, Peter and Jesus, kind of have this um, reunion of sorts, and they kind of amend things. Listen to this conversation. John chapter 21, And when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, remember, this is after the resurrection, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. And he said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. And Jesus says to him even the third time, Simon, do you love me? Peter was grieved. He was grieved. Because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he says to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus says to him, feed my sheep. The same guilt for betraying an innocent man consumed both of these two men, but where their paths diverged was in where their guilt took them, just like with David in Psalm 51. One to find a renewed spirit at the empty tomb, one to find death and despair by his own hand. I think if we're being honest, most of us aim to be Peters in this situation. We aim to run to God to deal with our guilt, but not always. I know I don't always. Why do you think that is? Well, for me, I think it has a lot to do with admitting that we can't do things our way. We can't do it on our own. We're forced to admit that we're weak, that we're not capable of doing this ourselves. And admitting our guilt in running to God certainly does do that. But that's not the weakness that we think it is, right? Because the Apostle Paul says God's strength is perfected, perfected in our weakness. That's what the Apostle Paul says. And in fact, he would probably know a lot about that because he's actually a man of guilt too. He's going to be the third person we're going to look at today because he was a man of guilt as well as the other two men. And let's see how he dealt with the mistakes of his past. Let's see how he came to find a renewed spirit moving forward. For the sake of time, I'm just going to summarize what I believed to be a very beautiful account in the book of Acts uh, in chapter 22, where Paul gets up and he starts to speak to the people there. And what he does is he has this sort of confession. He retells his past, how he goes from a Pharisee uh, that was a practicing Jew who persecuted Christians, and eventually he's converted by the revelation of Jesus in a vision, and he responds in baptism, and now he's on the other side, right? And so he admits, Paul blatantly admits to persecuting the way. And in addition to this, he would go on in chapter 22 and verse 20 to say that he presided and watched over people's executions, which are recorded for us in the books of Acts. He has just straight up got blood on his hands. One would imagine that transgressions like those, not only is he against Christianity at one point in his life, but he's working in the opposite direction of the way. He's working against God, right? Because of his sins and because of his arrogance, his unwillingness to see the truth. And so God reveals it to him. And what is his response to that? 
Once he does see Jesus, and Jesus asks him why he's doing this to him, and he responds and becomes a Christian, how does that change for him? Well, we find that Paul finds true renewal in his spirit through the blood of Jesus. And I think a passage that perfectly kind of sums this up for us this morning is found in Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, I'd like to draw our attention specifically to verses 7 through 10, which in this section, Paul is dealing with the mystery of the gospel and how it can be that people are saved and who Paul is and what happened to him. So look in verse 7 of Ephesians chapter 3, where Paul says this, Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace. So by God's gracious gift, Grace is a wonderful thing that we've been talking so much about in our Romans class, which Ed and Shane have been doing such a great job. Think about this gift that he's received, not for anything that Paul's done. If anything, when we look at Paul's actions, they're working in the opposite direction, right? When you look at everything he did to sabotage Christianity, his, his record of actions don't exactly help him in this situation. But by God's grace, he's become a partaker of the promise in Christ Jesus. And he says in verse 8, to me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given. You can see a sincere understanding and acceptance of the guilt for the transgressions that he has done. And what does that enable him to do? How does he reflect on his guilt? How does he respond to it after being renewed? It says, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God. That's his response to his guilt. Rather than just be haunted by his past, what does he do? Once he finds renewal of his spirit, he gets to work, man. He gets to work. He, he's working for God's cause in the right direction at this point. He looks back on his past and he says, this is who I was, this is who I am now. And so with the same zeal and the same passion that he had to work against Christianity, through his guilt, he now, because of his gratitude and thankfulness for the gift received in Christ Jesus, he labors hard for the cause of Christ. And I think ultimately... That's what our guilt teaches us. Our guilt is simply a reminder. Once we have had our spirit renewed, it is a reminder of where we came from, where we're working towards, the goal, the end, that is the prize in Christ Jesus. And that, my brothers and sisters, is a beautiful, beautiful thing. So as it turns out, our guilt is not a bad thing at all. Our guilt is not something that we should be ashamed of, something that has to haunt us. But rather, it is a reminder to us that we have had our debt lifted off of our shoulders. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, a beautiful verse, teaches us that for while we were still sinners, while we were still guilty, in other words, Christ died for the ungodly. Jesus did that for us. He did that for Peter. He did that for Paul. He did that for you and I, so that we no longer need to be haunted by guilt, but rather can look on our guilt as a means to continue to labor in his kingdom, to draw others nearer to God, so that they too can be relieved of their guilt, of their burdens. And that invitation extends to you this morning, to be relieved of your guilt, to find renewal of your spirit in Christ Jesus through his blood, which is the only thing that can cleanse you and make you whole. If we can help you this morning.